Welcome to the Multiverse Fundraiser. You are watching our comics and World War II history, which is a huge topic because comics and World War history basically go together like peanut butter and jelly. If you don't know much about this subject, you're going to learn a little today, whether you like it or not. Uh, I'm going to start off with my favorite story. So Captain America was fighting Nazis before the U.S. was. Jack Kirby helped make that decision. And there was a iconic Captain America cover where he is punching Hitler in the face. And so there were some Nazi sympathizers who showed up to the offices and were like, hey, who's this guy who's drawing Captain America? We want to we want to fight him. Right. So, so the people in the office were like, Jack, what do we do? And Jack's like, well, obviously, I'm going to go down there and show him what's what. He rolls up his sleeves. So people in the office are like, Jack, no. But he rolls up his sleeves. He goes downstairs. By the time he gets downstairs, they're gone. <laughs> because they're punks who could not stand up to Jack Kirby, who also did end up going overseas and actually fighting Nazis. So what you can take away from this is Jack Kirby's a badass, just like the character that he helped co-create. But before I bring in my panelists, before I, before we really get down to brass tacks about this, I'm going to roll our little ad so you know what this is all about. We're raising funds for comic books for kids, which is a fantastic charity that's close to all our hearts. So here you go. And this is what we do. I, we do this every day on Christmas Day. I was getting emails from hospitals on Christmas day. I was responding. Sickness doesn't take a break. We are there for the hospitals. We are there for the kids. Um, we will do whatever we can do. And I, as I look and talk to you and I, I talk to all the people who are watching this, be a part of this. You, however you want to be a part of this, be a part of it. If you can send us $5, send us $5, send us five comic books, Funko Pop, a toy, a children's book, send it to us. However you want to be, make a difference. Make a difference because we're all in this together. And here's the cool news. Nobody knows who I am and here's why. When we give these materials to the hospitals, the hospitals give it to the kids and the parents. Comic book for kids and my name never shows up. When this stuff goes to the military, when my comic shops send the pallets, my name is never there. And that's great. That's all right. Because it's not, as I said, about us. It's not about promoting who we are. It's about all of us together in the industry making a difference for so many. For so many. And that's what we're about, Kelly. And that's what we do every single day of the year. So there you have it. Um, you can donate a few different ways. You can go to our Facebook page at the Multiverse Fundraiser, or you can go directly to Comic Books for Kids. And even if this you're watching this long past our fundraiser, you can still donate at Comic Books for Kids. So I'm going to bring in my first co-panelist, uh, John Pica. So here's Johnny. Hey there, friends and foes. Good afternoon, Multiverse. This is uh, John Pike of the Prophet of Pop Culture. You can call me Johnny, Johnny Beyond, if you dare. And uh, Kelly, I'm so excited to be doing the Multiverse fundraiser. Um, if it weren't for um, my mom bringing me a stack of comics when I was in the hospital at five years old getting my tonsils removed, we would not have back of the cereal box and the cereal box network. We would not be doing what we are doing right now today if it were not for getting comics in the hospital. And it all started there for me. Um, my love affair with comic books and science fiction and action and adventure. And uh, so I'm a big believer in the whole mission of comic books for kids. It's so important on, on um, in, in ways that people can't even imagine. And if you haven't seen the interview with Mark Weiss, um, was that Friday that you guys did that? 
where he talks about and shares the stories of how comic books have impacted kids and families in the hospital. You really got to go back and watch it because it's unbelievable. The stories that he has to share. He was generous enough to give two interviews. So we had one as part of our pre-recorded uh, programming on Thursday where he shared some stories and he also got more into how he built up the charity from the ground up. And then on Friday, he shared more stories, both panels. I had to hold back the tears. Um, on Friday, Willow Schuyler joined me and then Andrea Starnes, my Cosplay Cafe co-host, was doing the admin stuff in the background. And we were all just in tears because he is a man with a beautiful heart a beautiful vision and those stories just get you because real people are being touched by this it's it's absolutely beautiful yeah yeah it's it's pretty fantastic and i'm so glad that we've been able to be partnered with them over the last three years and kind of culminating with uh, the multiverse fundraiser in a more focused network wide um endeavor so um yeah very very cool and i'm super excited about this topic comic books in world war ii and how comic books influenced world war ii i can't wait to get into this this is going to be a lot of fun yes and now we're going in reverse order we're going to bring on our host professor hollis thompson who knows his stuff welcome hollis hey kelly uh i hope i know my stuff <laughs> we'll see <laughs> Well, we'll uh, hold you. We'll hold you to the fire, Hollis. There you go. As uh, as one of my English professors when I was a student, Dr. Davis always said, "Once you become an academic, you realize how much you don't actually know <laughs> about your own topic. That's what it does for you. You realize how little you actually do know." So, but I'm super excited to talk about this topic with you guys. It is something I've been recently lecturing on, actually, at the college with. Uh, it's a college, but I have one 10th grade English class for a special group of students who are preparing to take college classes as 11th graders, freshmen at that age. And this semester we do comic book history and I um, we're almost done with the golden age right now. So I have been in the thing. Uh, That's perfect. Now you can show cool. this your kids. Yes, well... <laughs> They're actually getting, I gave them extra credit for being coming to any of the panels in this fundraiser, but they get extra, extra credit for being at this one because it's relevant to what we're talking about. So, Well, hi, Professor Thompson's kids, if any of you are out there watching. <laughs> they should post a comment in the chat. Yes, totally. Mm -hmm. But behave, remember. <laughs> so let's get into this. Uh, first of all, why? Why are World War II and comics, why are those so intertwined? Let's start with that. That's a really, well. The, that's a big question. Sorry. It is. <laughs> the first answer I would give is that the creation of what we now call comic books, right? Comics, as lots of scholars like Scott McCloud have argued, comics go back to the dawn of time right like comics are perhaps the single oldest storytelling medium that exists because if you look at like cave paintings right are comics uh a lot of egyptian right uh hieroglyphics are comics you have mayans and aztecs recording their history in pictorial sequential form but what we now think of as comics and comic books right came into existence very, very close, right? Just die maybe of a decade at most before World War II started. So they were a new mass medium that existed during that time. So that's one reason I think that they're so closely connected. I think you're right. I think especially superhero comics really burst out of the gate right before World War II. So it's just kind of this flashpoint where they're pretty similar points in history. And I feel like superheroes 
from my point of view, this is not an expert point of view, but I feel like superheroes came around just when the world needed them most. And I think that's kind of poetic to me because we really did need the hope that those early stories provided because the world was facing its darkest hour so far, unfortunately. And those stories really just got a lot of traction because of that. And it's hard to say, I mean, it's hard to say if they got popular because of that or if they were being written so much because of that I, need or a little both. Oh, go ahead, Johnny. I have a question for, for Hollis. So, um, you know, you mentioned something about, you know, comics in, in well, art and artistic storytelling existing since the dawn of time, basically. But, you know, a lot of people consider American comic books, you know, a pictorial history of American mythology. But, you know, long before the first comic books were printed in mass, we had the dime novels of the Old West. Um, were, were, were those dime novels also featuring illustrated stories that would qualify, quote unquote, as comics, you know, telling the stories of Billy the Kid and Wyatt Earp and Bass Reeves and and American folklore, you know, stories like Johnny Appleseed and John Henry and uh, Pecos Bill, you know, how, how were there actual comics in those dime novels or were they just illustrated or do you know the answer to that? I, I do know the answer to that. This is not by any means my, uh, my field of specialty, the dime novels, though I did read them in grad school. I had a professor who specifically for the Western ones, that was a big part of his scholarship. So he forced us all to read uh, <laughs> some of those dime <laughs> novels, uh, right? And like somewhere on my shelf, I have the anthology he assigned us. So, but I will say those definitely were not comic books in the right. sense that they were very much prose stories. And if they were illustrated, and they usually were, but those illustrations were like few and far between, right? And they were definitely chosen as like the most shock value rather than to necessarily be an essential part of telling the story. So they, they do anticipate, I think, the role that superheroes come to have in American culture. And a lot of those characters are, you could argue, uh, proto-superheroes, or even depending on how you define a superhero, that's a point of contention in scholarship. But you could, you could argue that some of those characters are very much superheroes, especially someone like Zorro, for instance, right? You have the secret identity, you have the costume, you have all of those sorts of things. So they're well, definitely, I think, an important precursor. Oh, well, I mean, I mean, it goes back even further to that. You know, um, I'm just talking about American history, but, you know, when you get into Greek and Roman mythology and, um, you know, obviously um, some of the prose uh, of the uh, Victorian era, you know, like um, the uh, Scarlet Pimpernel was I mean, essentially, he's considered the first masked superhero. But um, yeah, um, I, I was just curious about the dime novels and how that uh, played in 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 terms of the history. Sorry to get off topic if I am, but uh, I know you have an outline that I've not seen. So, <laughs> oh, that's totally cool. Outlines are there to be used or discarded. <laughs> I do think one thing that it would be worth talking about in terms of how American comics, a lot of times uh, academics will talk about how they reflect, right? Comics are like a mirror for every time period reflects back the issues of that time period. But one of the things that's interesting to me about World War II is as you already started talking about, Kelly, in some ways, American comics actually didn't just reflect, but shaped American history in terms of World War II. For instance, that very famous Captain America character you talked about with this cover, right? The first Captain America comics, completely iconic, right? Of Captain America punching what? Adolf Hitler in the face, right? And like you said, the interesting thing is that this character was created by two Jewish guys, right? And they portrayed this American superhero fighting Nazis 
right, before Pearl Harbor, right, before America was actually involved in World War II. And it's very interesting that it was almost prophetic, right, in how it portrayed something that would eventually happen before it actually happened. It was not only prophetic, it was them making a political statement that America should be involved, which I think is fascinating. That's why this time period and comics is so fascinating to me because of, like you said, how the comics kind of shaped history in this time period as much as history shaped comics. It's fascinating. Art does shape the course of human history, but this is just like a direct example where you can point to this. And this, this was them saying, hey, we should be involved. And because they are two Jewish guys, they're sitting back going, this is horrible. We live in a country that is built on ideals that are directly opposed to what's happening to Jewish people. And our country is doing nothing. Why? Why are they doing nothing? So they created this hero. And they were like, well, we're going to have him get involved. And that was not popular. Well, and they said with my story. Oh, well, ahead. and Kelly, you know, um, what, what's really funny is today we're still having this argument. I, I see it all the time. People say, well, I'm sick of the Hollywood agenda or I'm sick of the, the you know, the diver- the first d- forced diversity agenda in comics. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time that art has to have an agenda to be art. Um, art should have an agenda. Whether you agree with the agenda or not is up to you. But Mm -hmm. good art has a viewpoint. Good art has an agenda to inform, educate, to influence. And comics are no different. And, you know, we're obviously talking about World War II agendas and, and influence. But we saw it all the way through the civil rights movement, through the, um, the eighties with the, uh, you know, comics fought against the, the stigma of the satanic panic. And, um, you know, there's always been an agenda in comics. And I, I love that it really comes out full bodied during world war two. Me too. Also Molly Daniels says, hello all. I just finished reading the American way about the relationships between a Jewish immigrant the creator, distributor of Superman and Marilyn Monroe. Very informative. Okay, I need to read that. That's, That's kind of cool. It sounds really interesting. I haven't read that one. Molly, can you inbox that to me so I don't forget? Because I will. Because my mind is a sieve right now. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, oh, go, go, ahead. go ahead, Hollis. No, no, no. You go ahead. I have a question. So, because w- I'm sure we're going to get into this. but. You know, my background um, is in theater and, and in particular, um, stage magic. And during uh, World War II, um, magicians were employed a lot as spies and as strategists. Neville Mescaline in England created an illusion to make the British Navy look 10 times larger than it was. And... Um, and they, the American um, playing card company, Bicycle Playing Cards, printed playing cards with maps of Europe. When, when you assembled the cards, it gave you a map of Europe to soldiers. And they, they printed playing cards with secret messages in them. Um, and I'm just curious if comic publishers did the same thing. I know, I know there were c- cartoons made that included secret messages and secret information, but did comic books do the same thing? If they have, no one has figured it out yet. Okay. So like, as far as I'm aware, that sounds like the great topic for somebody's dissertation, to be honest with you, uh, is to uh, figure out if there were any secret messages in comic books. One thing, this is something I also thought it was worth talking about. What's interesting is that a lot of people don't necessarily understand this, but during World War II, 
America, the governmental structure became a communist country, right? The government yeah. took over the means of almost every type of production in the country because the idea was this is a world war and if they're going to survive, all hands need to be on deck. They need There needs to be a centralized control of everything to make sure that they can do everything as efficiently as possible to get out of here. And one of the only industries to actually avoid that happening to was comic books. Comic books did not actually get controlled by the government. But what's interesting is that comic book, the biggest, let me put it this way, the sole greatest, single greatest customer of the comic book publishers was the American government because they were buying the lion shares of the copies of the comics and shipping them out to soldiers overseas. Well, and, and that's why they asked that question because yeah. I knew that was happening. Mm -hmm, exactly. So the, the what somebody would have to figure out is how closely was the government actually working with the publishers of those comics, right? Because from everything we, we can tell, at least what I can tell, there were no direct mandates on the comic book publishers like they shall do X, Y, and Z in their stories and they shall not do X, Y, and Z. But at the same time, we know that comics were very propagandistic in nature. And yes, that is, very. But the irony is that it looks like that wasn't because the government was directly controlling them, as in dictating what they did, but as they were the single greatest customer of those comics, right? They were doing everything they possibly could to make sure that the government was happy with them, right? Yeah. So that they didn't take those comics. Okay, so them. how do I get a university to pay me to study this? Because I want, I, I want, I want to do this study. <laughs> well, so, someone uh, give me the money. You're you can like, enroll in a graduate program, but that's going to cost you money rather than the other way around. Dang it! Uh, or you could get with somebody who's already got a degree, and then you could co-publish. So that's another oh, okay. another thing you could. Well, and you know, speaking about the propaganda, you know, some of the articles that I uh, read before doing this, you know, it talks about how. Comics were largely seen as influential propaganda for children. And, you know, like bringing the youth of America on the side of, uh, you know, against the Axis powers. And, um, you know, I wonder if that's why, you know, yes, they shipped a bunch overseas to soldiers to read, but. I wonder if the federal government just kind of kind of thought, well, you know, this is just fluff entertainment and was kind of a, like they were kind of above overseeing it. Maybe. They didn't consider it I, hard news, right? Yeah. But again, the people who read comics during that time period was so different. Like, as I tell my students, comic books during World War II were kind of had the status of like, Disney movies have today where okay. sure children read them and children read them a lot. Right. And there were sure that they didn't put anything in those comics that would be like inappropriate for children. To read. But children were by no means the only ones reading comics. They knew that teenagers and adults in large numbers, right. were reading these comics, especially soldiers out on the front. And so there were, there was nothing that would have been considered like, distasteful for children to be reading inside of them. But there were definitely also some things that would have gone completely over the kids' heads, right? And that only the adult audience would have understand. Similarly, right, to how a lot of those Disney movies are today. Because at least in my experience, it is not only children who watch Disney movies uh, that come out. They today. slip those adult jokes in there. Mm -hmm, now, exactly. going back to the propaganda, but I think What's interesting is, so before the U.S. got involved with the war, there were, uh, they could show sympathetic Germans in comics, but afterwards, there was something across the board with the industry. Now, whether this probably wasn't mandated, but where they could not show sympathetic Germans. And then also Japanese people were drawn in such a way that dehumanized them. 
So there was definitely the propaganda was very big on dehumanizing the enemy. And that's where a lot of the racial stereotypes that you see in the earlier comics that stuck around even after the war was over come from. So you just see, and I didn't upload any pictures, but, um, but you see that art that just shows the Japanese people with more animalistic features, just definitely more stylized and it's interesting, but Germans were, because Germans were mostly white, they didn't, dehumanize them quite as much but they did also as soon as the u.s entered the war they could not ever show a sympathetic german who maybe didn't like all germans had to be nazis they all had to be bad guys so it's just kind of interesting that the propaganda definitely was there it had to be there and it had to paint the people we were fighting against as straight up villains straight up not quite human to make it easier for us to cope with the horrors of war and the horrors of how many people were dying in the effort for the war for both children at home. But I think also for the soldiers, it's easier if you dehumanize your enemy. And I think that's one of the reasons why maybe soldiers gravitated towards comic books and found comfort in comic books because it simplified this mess they were in. Well, I and I- on the money. And I've got to think that there's there's some inspiration inspirational um, motivation in the heroics of the characters in the comics that you know would motivate soldiers to you know ha- have more courage, have more strength to emulate their heroes. So, like in in comics today, and in a lot of media today, there's I think this driving for complexity right in terms of characters and usually what people mean by that is characters who are flawed right characters who have these issues you don't really see flawed superheroes in the in the golden age there's a couple things but they're very very minor like the biggest one i can think of is the fact that in the wonder woman comics right the fact that diana is still has these romantic feelings for a guy who really frankly is kind of a loser right like way Steve out Tyler, of her league uh, she's uh, right out is, of his league <laughs> exactly is like somewhat of more of like the one thing right about her character that is not like just inhumanly perfect right and so but besides that and even that is kind of like you know a pretty minor thing as sort of character uh, flaws go. But I think that was kind of the point, right? And I, I I don't think that Golden Age comics are actually boring for having superheroes who are flawless. I think that the stories still work, especially when, like you guys have already been saying, when the people who are reading these comics were in an environment where they knew that straight up evil was very real, right? And they needed the hope, I think, of very simplistic superhero stories where you have a good guy versus a bad guy, right? And the good guy always comes out on top. It might be a very hard struggle, but he will, or she, right? Wonder Woman and Black Canary come out on top (laughs) at the end. And they needed that hope because in the real world, they didn't know if the good guys were going to win, right? They didn't know for sure what the outcome of this war was going to be. And they needed to cling on to something to say that the good guys will win at the end of this thing. So I like David McDonald's um, contribution that comics were also a reminder of home, which is also important when they're so far away and in such an alien environment like a combat zone, which, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting that most of the superheroes were never depicted on the front lines, right? With the exception of Captain America and Wonder Woman, right? Those were more or less the only two who were actively participating. And, you know, that was that was uh, something that I was going to ask you about, because in the modern age, you know, the the 
80s and beyond, um, stories have been retconned to where our superheroes, DC, Marvel characters were actively involved in the front lines. But during the actual era, they weren't. And I've always wondered why. Sorry, I was a little bit distracted. Can you say that again? I am also a flawed human. Honestly. That's okay. So, I, I, you know, like if you read uh, DC's All-Star Squadron from the 80s, that depicted the Justice Society of America actively engaged in the front lines. Um, and Marvel has gone back and retconned a bunch of their stories that Captain America wasn't alone on the front lines with the invaders and whatnot. But during the actual war, during the era, that was rare. Like you mentioned, Captain America and Wonder Woman was about it. And I've always wondered why that was. Why didn't they have Superman flying in and taking out, you know, entire battalions and whatnot? Well, they came up with an in-universe explanation for why Superman wasn't there. I just discovered this a couple of days ago, actually. They had him fail, Clark Kent fail the military exam when he got drafted <laughs> because it was like, because of him being Kryptonian, right? Like they, he failed the eye exam because he accidentally used his x-ray vision and was reading like the chart in the other room <laughs> instead of the one yep. that was in front of him. So that's how they came up with like an in-story explanation for why Superman wasn't uh, on the front line. But I think another reason is just frankly, the publishers thought that it would be disrespectful to show someone like Superman just swooping in and fixing the war in a matter of minutes. When in reality, so many real heroes were out there sacrificing their lives, right, in this very difficult oh, war effort to make it happen, to make that victory happen, which was not going to be an easy at all. So I think that that's the main reason why the publishers were really reluctant to do that. And once you were in the 80s, right, it didn't matter anymore, <laughs> right? Because at that point, the war was history and it didn't, it didn't matter. It wasn't going to like, cause a big emotional uproar because by that point, you know, America was on the winning side of that and it was history now. So I think by that point, it just no longer mattered. There is specifically an essay written about that, about why Superman didn't go into World War II that cites the exact reasons you just gave Hollis. And it was a conscious decision because it would not ring true to the troops it would be a slap in the face and it it would be painful to read to it it wouldn't provide comfort it wouldn't provide hope it it would defeat the purpose of what comics books stood for in that era and yeah. real quick we're at the halfway point so i just want to remind everyone that you are watching comic books and world war ii history we're part of the multiverse fundraiser we're raising money for comic books for kids. I'm going to run a real quick ad just to let you know what we're all about. The Multiverse Fundraiser is partnering with Comic Books for Kids to raise money for their cause. Their mission is to provide comic books to children in hospitals and cancer centers across the United States, Canada, and the UK. We believe in the importance of providing stories that promote hope and bravery to kids who are facing things that are scarier than any supervillain. And we truly believe in this cause. To donate, you can either go to our Facebook page at www.facebook.com backslash the Multiverse Fundraiser or directly to comicbooksforkids.org. And we are back. Yeah, one thing I also wanted to show you guys, if that's okay, with the propaganda aspect of heroes, is even though they weren't ever portrayed in the comics on the front lines, there were a lot of covers that were very propagandistic, patriotic covers that were meant that had no relation to any of the stories inside the comics, but were designed to be that kind of propagandistic. Some of them are a bit... Uh, unnerving for people who know these characters like their modern day versions like for instance uh this batman one right 
is uh, quite different from the modern Batman that doesn't use guns, right? To having a Gatlin gun, Robin feeding him the ammo and mowing him down. I <laughs> love this. <laughs> keep those bullets flying. Keep on buying war ones. You know what, though? Batman did use guns for quite a while mm -hmm. until they decided to give him an in-universe reason to not use guns because they wanted to be more child friendly. So <laughs> for sure. But once again, the war bond thing, and you'll see that in all kinds of these kinds of covers, right? And what was going on there was war bonds, for those of you who don't know, were basically a loan to the federal government of your money, right? You would buy a bond for however much money it was. And they were being used to raise funds for the war, right? To be able to cover the production of weapons and vehicles and all those sorts of things. And so that was one of the ways the comics were most effective, probably at propaganda, was to convince people to go ahead and buy those war bonds or to do other things like recycle, right? The reason Golden Age comics are so scarce today is because most of them were recycled <laughs> in the different paper drives because paper was extremely scarce. So one of the ironies of those things. And this is one of my absolute favorite uh, covers from the Golden Age um, <laughs> with uh, Batman and Robin. I want to read this story if there was a story to go with this. Someone write there this story. Wasn't. <laughs> there wasn't. I, I know, but I want it. <laughs> you know what's... I, the 4th of July. Exactly. And, and right there, we see it again, buy war bonds. And you know what's ironic about that is that... Um, the, the government never really paid back those bonds. They just convinced people to buy more bonds and reinvest. There, there are people who bought war bonds during World War II still alive today that have never been paid back, cashed out. Uh, they're still in investment accounts somewhere. I, I find that hysterical. Well, as we all know now, the federal government tends to be very bad about paying off its debt. So that's how it goes. Thank you oh. for saying it so I didn't have to. <laughs> I I will be frank about that. Well, you know, the best thing that the American government does is break things and kill people. Did I just say that out loud? Oh, boy. If this feed gets <laughs> cut off, um, y'all know And say, hey, hello, hello. As I put another comic cover up. Uh, <laughs> so this Ellie is also... Patillo wants... <laughs> Haley wants to know, but do people still have the war bonds as an investment? Some do, yes. There, there's a large pool of unpaid war bonds that have just been reinvested every time the bond comes due. Um, literally, the federal government convinces those investors oh to gosh. just take the dividends and reinvest them into more bonds. What have we started? Apparently, this is our <laughs> nerd unite against the government. <laughs> panel according to Crandall McDowell. We are starting a revolution here in addition to raising money for charity. No, we are not starting a revolution. NSA, that is <laughs> no. not true. Not true. Not yes. really. That uh, was a joke. That was a joke yes, for legal purposes. Was that was a joke. It was a joke. Uh, you really have Hamilton to blame for it though because it goes back a lot deeper than just World War II in American history. The, the relationship with debt also, hashtag not a history professor, by the way. Uh, but it, it does go back to everybody's favorite uh, founding father without a father. Am Alexander Hamilton was the first one to begin this whole go into as much debt as possible because that's a good thing. Uh, so there you Alexander go. Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> His exactly. name is Alexander Hamilton. This cover I also oh. enjoy immensely. Uh, <laughs> it was one of the latest, actually. From the <laughs> tail end of the war. Yeah. It was promoting something called the Seventh War Loan, which was where they were still trying. They had beaten Hitler by this point, right? But they still were in this thing uh, until it was over. And so they were having to try harder to convince people to still be invested post Hitler being oh. out of the picture, which was the Seventh War Loan. And so that's where this hat this came into play. Well, and without the Seventh <laughs> War Loan... And and the bombing, uh, you know, the the atomic bomb being invented, we would not have Godzilla. So <laughs> you know, 
That is something Great I think ass. that's also has to be talked about if we're going to discuss comics and World War II is that right after World War II, there is a crash in the comic industry. And part of that comes from the military no longer buying comics for soldiers, right? That's the, their biggest customer is gone right now. And then secondly, I, I really think, and this is my opinion as a scholar, and this is, there are other scholars who will disagree with me about this. So I'll put that out there. But in my opinion, I think there was also a psychological reason that superheroes just go out of, go out of popularity really fast after World War II. And I, I really think that is because of how World War II ended and how I think for a lot of people, they, were, they didn't believe in good guys anymore, right? Well, so and, and, and ha- what a slap in the face to returning soldiers who are wounded, they've lost limbs, they've lost eyes, they've become disabled, to be putting these perfect godlike characters up in front. Because that's when we saw the the... Uh, the Western genre of comics become overwhelmingly the most popular. Real people, you know, in real situations, but not in contemporary era. So, yeah, escape to the past, right? Because the present is so horrifying at the moment. But in similar to the Godzilla stuff, this is also the post war, the immediate post war period is where you have the birth of manga, right? The beginning of Japanese comics, because with the American occupation of Japan, right, those American soldiers brought their comic books with them, right, that they had gotten from the federal government. And so the very first uh, manga artists, like Ozama Tezuki, right, who is the creator of Astro Boy and, um, Kimba the White Lion, and many, many, many other like, classics of the manga genre. He was inspired, right, by his own life, first of all, because he was an eyewitness to the atomic bomb. He saw the mushroom cloud himself, right, with his own eyes, and he saw the fallout from that. But then he also had the influence of the American comics coming in, right? And so you mix those together and you get Astro Boy, right, basically. And yeah, that's that's super fascinating. Something I never even thought about. But I mean, that makes perfect sense. Today's modern manga is born of World War II and American comic books. Mind exactly. blown. Yeah, and again, you see that in a lot of, especially Tezuka, his early stuff, right? Because Astro Boy is very much a comment on the use and misuse of technology, right? Because Astro Boy is a robot, right? But he's also a robot that is a surrogate son, right? To a scientist who has lost his child. And both ways that went in Japan, right? You had parent uh, children who were orphaned on a massive scale, right? From parents who were dead because of the atomic bomb. And you also had the other way, parents who lost their children because of that. Uh, again, I've, n- I've not watched it because I probably, I know myself and I know I can't take it, but if you want to get an idea for this, watch Grave of the Fireflies, right? By Studio Ghibli. Uh, and you'll cry for days and days and days, apparently. But that gives you... <laughs> an idea of what it was like, right? And so you see Astro Boy, who is the embodiment of technology done right, but he's constantly fighting people who use technology for evil, right? In the course of those stories, evil robots, right? Created by evil scientists who are doing bad things. And so you see that all throughout that history. I did not know this. So David McDonald says, semi-related, the U.S. Army has its own comic book. It's called P.S., the Preventative Maintenance Monthly that's been running since 1942. It's meant to be educational, but funny. And, and he would know. He, he was in the service. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that Eisner did it, that totally makes sense that it's educational and funny because he's one of those... American masters, right, of the comics genre. Mm-hmm. It, it pretty much anything he touched turned to gold. It's hilarious. Now I have to look that up. I did not know that. So that's that's something new that I just learned. Yes. 
I will also say again to touch on something other than superhero comics. All comics, right, were influenced by World War II, including newspaper comics, right? Even ones that weren't about the war directly, like Little Orphan Annie is one that I recently discovered. I, I have to still track down the research to know if this is 100% true or not. But it appears that something that the creator of Little Orphan Annie put in the Annie comics became real later, which was he had uh, Annie create this kind of like organization of kids who were dedicated to like became organized into like ranks and they had sergeants like Annie was the sergeant I think mm -hmm. of it and they were dedicated to collecting materials right that could be useful to the war effort like scrap metal and things like that and again I have to I'm not going to say for sure that it's true yet I'm still waiting for some books to come in from interlibrary loan to know 100% if this is real but it seems like there were real kids who then actually did that right <laughs> who organized themselves in those types of things because of little orphan annie well my my father used to tell stories about being part of the akron youth auxiliary in akron ohio and that's what they did is they went door to door with their wagons collecting you know, pots and pans, you know, broken radios and toasters and paper and all of that and taking it oh, to wow. the uh, to the recycling center. And that's what they called it was the youth auxiliary. But, you know, that's that's pretty cool. That may very well have been because of Little Orphan Annie. Does that happen. That's awesome. And, and I only know this because I did several productions of the musical Annie both as Rooster Hannigan and Daddy Warbucks, the original musical production ends with um, America um, l like preparing to leave World War II with uh, FDR's New Deal. And uh, the, the, the finale number was, we'll have a new deal for Christmas. And it was all about winning the war and um, ushering in a new golden age for America. Oh, wow. And you know what's so ironic about that is that the creator of Annie, and I'm sorry, his name is slipping my mind right now. I can't remember his name. Uh, but he was a very, very staunch libertarian. And he could not stand FDR. And as a matter of fact, uh, in the comics, there's a whole period of four years during one of FDR's terms where he got reelected. The character of Daddy Warbucks hated FDR. And when he saw that he got reelected, he went into a coma for four years because of learning that FDR had been reelected. So for four years of Annie stories, Daddy Warbuck was just in a coma because of FDR being reelected. Oh my gosh. I, I did not know that. Martin Charnin was his name. <laughs> really? McDonald says disliking FDR is one of the only things libertarians agree on. Oh wait, no, Martin Ch Martin Charning was the uh, creator of the musical. Never mind. Ah, uh, yeah, that name didn't sound right. But again, ah, uh, any of us can do a Google search. I'll do it. Clean up my own mess. Harold Gray. Harold uh, Gray. There you go. That sounds yep. right. Yep. And he did that. He did that comic strip till he died. So it was like of that well you so you know little orphan annie is is a cultural phenomenon in itself if you guys didn't know this and this makes sense to the point that you spoke of hollis about annie organizing you know community groups and whatnot if, if this is true um today there's still an organization nationally called annie people they are fervent fans. They're kind of like deadheads. They travel the country and go to productions of Annie. They collect Annie memorabilia. I mean, it's a big, big thing. And, um, you know, every production I did of Annie, the Annie people would show up in droves. It was a little bit cool and a little bit bizarre and just a tad frightening. It's also just a great show, right? It is one of the classics of the American musical genre, in my humble opinion. 
it's it's a really really great show and it and he is a great character right just period it's really really well done compelling story in many many ways i will also say Oh, no, I was going to ask what else did you have that you wanted to hit on your outline since we're running low on time? <laughs> we have pretty much made it through. We've hit all the major points I wanted to talk about. Are there okay. any maybe comments from the audience about questions that they want to ask any of us about comic book history during World War II? Well, uh, the audience has gone a little quiet, so I think we've stunned them with our intellect. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I wanted to make a point about the fact that so during World War II, things got very interesting for women and women absolutely their roles changed because men were going off to war and that was reflected in comics. I mean, obviously Wonder Woman came along during World War II, but also you had other more minor comic characters, their roles were changing. So there was a comic where Mary Marvel was going around doing things in America. Um, I forget the exact, but I think she was like working in a factory or something. And just you see, but you also see women becoming more empowered. And then when there was a, that other shift where the men came back from war, you saw the pushback and well, seduction of the innocent and all of a sudden <laughs> Lois Lane was Superman's girlfriend <laughs> and well, nothing more. Well, if you, if you look at some of those women superheroes of this age, Miss Fury, um, the blonde Phantom, uh, Domino lady, uh, Phantom lady. Um, they were all super powerful and they were, they were like almost male counterparts, male substitutes, but those comic creators knew back during the golden age that sex sells. So their costumes were almost, almost uh, not there. And they were worthy of being painted on like bomber jets and stuff. They were bombshells, literally. Yes. And on that also note, I'm going to, pop off to get ready for the next stream and let you two finish us off. So thank you for a wonderful yeah. panel. Thank you, my Kelly. Go ahead, Hollis. My one last note I'll say on that topic is that those characters you just mentioned were still in terms of the number of female characters in comics in the extreme minority, right? Because most of the female characters, with the exception of those characters, and also Wonder Woman, obviously, and Black Canary, most women were either damsels in distress or femme fatales. <laughs> that was like, that's the two choices you got. You're either uh, helpless and need to be rescued, or you're evil. <laughs> if you're a woman, one of the two, right? And that is... On the one hand, a lot of feminist scholars appreciate that femme fatales were present in those golden age comics but it is still ultimately pra uh, problematic that in many cases if you're a powerful woman well you're obviously evil, <laughs> right rather than that and that's part of why those characters you talked about and also again wonder woman and black canary were so progressive for their times hey we've got a great question here um crayley asks, do you think that comics experiencing a boom in World War II is why so many other mediums focus a lot on World War II for settings, flashbacks, or world building? And I would say that partly yes, but there are other reasons. But what, what say you, Hollis? I think I'm going to agree with you because, again, the irony is that a lot of those comics weren't actually set on the front lines of World War II, right? Uh, so the even though the war was present on the covers, right, again, except for Captain America and Wonder Woman, the stories weren't necessarily war wartime settings. So I'm, I'm not sure how much comics actually influenced, like, World War II, like the front lines of World War II. 
influence on people. Well, you know, I, I'm thinking about so much of contemporary pop culture today is set during World War II and a lot of science fiction. The, the science fiction books that I write is set during World War II. And I think it's a dividing point in history. You know, we typically think of BC and AD, but really there's before uh, before Poland <laughs> and after Nagasaki. World War II split history in half. And it was such a monumental, traumatic event for the world that it 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 literally scarred our DNA and and our genetic memory is always drawn back to those moments in history. Does that make any sense at all? I think so. I think that's a really great explanation. The only thing I could add is that, again, just from a storytelling standpoint, it's a great drama, right? You have an actual supervillain. Yes. Right? A real villain. Hitler. Exactly. A real life maniacal uh, dictator, right? Bent on taking over Europe, if not the world, right? And you have the players in that drama are interesting characters, right? Like Churchill and Stalin, right? And FDR. These are people who are definitely not, I would say, two-dimensional good guys. I'd say each of them have some real flaws, right? Even the ones we think of as the good guys. Uh, as some of my professors said, as, as yucky as it is to say this, from a historical standpoint, it might be a good thing that FDR died when he did, because if he hadn't, we might have replaced one Fuhrer with another, <laughs> right? Uh, but that is what makes it a compelling story, right? Because you have characters that are so in many ways, larger than life, and yet also very human and very flawed. Yeah. So we, ha we have two minutes, and um, th we, uh, we the comments have kind of uh, vanished. So in these last two minutes, Hollis, I, I mentioned at the very top what got me into comic books. It was getting comic books at the hospital, you know, along with our, our theme with comic books for kids. What got you into comic books? Oh, you're going to date me. Um, so, uh, ironically, it is superheroes that got me into comic books because I was first familiar with superheroes from other mediums, specifically from movies and TV. I watched Batman the Animated Series when I was a kid. I grew up on that TV show. And as my mom can tell you, I dressed as Batman when I was like three years old, right? And it was because of learning about those characters from those mediums. And I don't know when it came, but eventually I discovered a comic book and realized that these comic books were about those superheroes, right? And then I was like really wanting to read those comics because of those superheroes. So, oh, so that's the main reason. You, you came to comics after they left the newsstands. Yes, very much so. Uh, what a, what a, what a wonderful time that was to be able to go to your grocery store, your drug store, and half the newsstand was comic books. And um, definitely that was the case during World War II. I've seen pictures of those newsstands, and comic books pretty much dominated the newsstands during that time. It was the mass media, right? Yeah. Besides radio, that was basically it, right? Wow. We didn't have other things. Wow. Well, we want to thank everyone for tuning in. We are at the top of the hour. This has been Comic Books in World War II with Dr. Hollis Thompson. And oh, um, not Dr. Professor. Prof oh. Oh. So sorry. No, no, no. That's so I take a step down, right? I don't wanna yeah. I don't want people to think I'm more than I am. So that's <laughs> that's that. Prof is a step down from Doctor. Well, Professor Hollis Thompson. And um Hollis, um, thank you so much for being a part of the Multiverse Fundraiser. You always add so much texture and, and richness. And we want to thank everyone who has been watching or listening. Um, you will be able to hear this back as an audio podcast in the next couple of weeks. And if you're wondering, okay, what is all of this comic books for kids thing? You can donate uh, and help their mission at comic books 
4kids.org or cb4k.org. Or you can go to our Facebook page, The Multiverse Fundraiser, and click Donate right from the Facebook page. And um, that would be great. We are about halfway, a little bit more than halfway to our goal. Uh, we have a goal of 1,500. We're a little over 900. So all of you who have been participating, watching, listening, please, 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 please donate to make sure that kids in the hospital get a comic book. And uh, Hollis, thank you again to everyone watching. Love you, mean it. And we'll catch you on the back of the cereal box. Farewell. So long. Auf Wiedersehen. Bonjour. I did that backwards, but that's okay.